Minister Ohisalo, um, distinguished keynote speakers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first um, bring greetings from Tampere. Um, last week, exactly 20 years after the Tampere Special European Council in 1999, uh, we uh, had an event in Tampere where our Minister Oisalo was the keynote speaker. Uh, it was hosted by the city of Tampere. Uh, and um, uh, after having uh, a conference in, in the university, we <clears throat> had dinner, and before that, a bronze plaque was attached to the wall of the, the site, Vaprik, it is called, of the summit. Um, tonight, I am um, looking forward to re reminiscing Tampere with my dear colleague, uh, Director General Antonio Vitorino. So, at this stage, this much about Tampere. But we had a very good, very good conference there. Having been present at the creation in Tampere uh, with my form, dear former colleague, uh, Director General Antonio Vitorino, and some others. Um, here, uh, present today from, from Tampere 99. I'm both happy and amazed by the spectacular way the International Organization for Migration and other organizers of this conference are commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Tampere European Council. Particularly impressed am I uh, by the <clears throat> participation of the best experts from Europe and other parts of the world gathering here to a real working session to update Tampere and plan for the future. The Tampere Special Summit aimed at establishing an area of freedom, security and justice in the European Union. We did not start from scratch, as we would work on the basis of the Amsterdam Treaty. But it was the first time the European Union Justice and Home Affairs were given a concrete framework, crystallized in the 10 Tampere milestones. In a book by top European experts, uh, under the leadership of Philip Descotet, the, the great European uh, uh, ex, uh, <laughs> Tampere in this book was included among the 15 most important summits in the 60-year history of the European Union. A lot of work has been done and progress made since Tampere, we're talking about the Hague and uh, Stockholm processes and, and etc. Uh, at the same time, the challenges have grown bigger. We did not quite expect the surge of terrorism, 9-11, nor the mass inflow of asylum seekers in 2015. We did not foresee the multiple conflicts and the disruption of international relations we have witnessed in the past few years. For the European Union, and I am referring to the speech by the Minister, it is time to understand that time is running out. 
We've got this parliamentary period of the European Parliament to put our own house in order. Otherwise, the uh, European Union internal political climate will turn into an even more divisive direction and the geopolitical standing of the European Union will be further weakened. Migration, demographic changes are, of course, the tough, toughest challenge. Towards the end of the century, world population statistics will be turned upside down. If, if as according to a prediction, there will be 650 million uh, people in working age in Nigeria, uh, and as many in China, but, but yet 2,100. So that, that's uh, maybe what's going to happen. Uh, we must think rationally about our own interest. That is, of course, important for the Union. In my opinion, there's too much negativism. Why don't we talk about our successes? Take integration in Germany. We, we had just some reports, and I, I, I read in the Spiegel magazine, uh, how <clears throat> many of those arrived in and after 2015, have learned the language, graduated from schools, and, uh, and got jobs. In Finland, we can do much more in integration, sending people away who have been integrated, like got a school, uh, graduating and and and, uh, and so on is actually a real waste of resources uh, and I'd, I'd like to coin a new term harmful deportation ladies and gentlemen securing the European Union's external borders better is an urgent task and must be financed I, I noted that in, in one of the papers, there's criticism that the Tampere financing was not discussed. Well, I, I've got a simple answer. We could never have finished the meeting had we discussed financing. <laughs> so it's absolutely clear. Cooperation with Africa, the Middle East, and other regions must be a priority for the European Union institutions to tackle the root causes of migration, including climate change. Organized crime, trafficking in people, a tragic accident, uh, incident in, in Britain, as an example, money laundering, uh, this is rampant in Europe. They must be fought, uh, and with our support, more effectively in, for example, countries seeking European Union membership. I mean, if there's a clear evidence of continuing mafia activity, uh, uh, something really must be done. But these problems uh, extend to our attitudes uh, like we've recently seen uh, happening uh, in the cases of money laundering up in the north. In all societies, inequality is creating tension, conflict, and spurring tendencies away from democracy. Social unrest can be manipulated by non-democratic, even foreign actors. Basic values and democratic rights are being threatened 
by mental regression, a return to a non-democratic past. Ladies and gentlemen, the multiple fields of action, goals and tasks defined in the working papers of this conference are well formulated. We heard the minister uh, inform about the ambitious agenda of the Finnish presidency and, and uh, I'd like to wish good luck. It's better be ambitious than, than just uh, uh, fo follow uh, the, the given, uh, given agenda. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us honor the legacy of Tampere by, by making this conference a landmark in the process started 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. In my case, it doesn't make a difference being standing or sitting. <laughs> so good morning to all of you, Honorable Minister, dear fellow speakers. Thank you for the invitation to be here today for a discussion on the Tempera Program's 20th anniversary. And particular thanks to the Odysseus Network, the European Network on Migration, and the European Policy Center. As uh, former Prime Minister Pavel Liponen has recalled, I was indeed present at the inception of uh, Tempere in 1999. Uh, once more today, with the Finnish presidency of the European Union, I'm wondering if I also qualify for a 2.0 software upgrade. <laughs> That this conference is timely goes without saying, but we are also having this conversation in the aftermath of a political existential crisis for the European Union with respect to many of the lofty goals of the temporary conclusions that has strained the concepts of solidarity and responsibility sharing and the relationship between many member states and European institutions. Four years after the arrival of a large number of refugees and migrants across the Eastern Mediterranean and a series of emergency midnight European summits culminating in the EU-Turkey statement, there are, I hope, at least I try to see them, there are signs that Europe is now slowly emerging from the trauma of that experience in 2015-16 and reflecting upon the lessons learned. Lessons that will be important for the new incoming parliament and the new incoming commission. This conference will be, I hope, an opportunity to draw deeply on that learning. But the European Union should not be complacent. The situation today on the Syrian border with Turkey demonstrates the fragile nature of displacement that still affects millions in the region and may yet have implications for Europe. The same could, by the way, be said about the very unstable internal situation in Libya. While we are unlikely to see a resumption of the large numbers of 2015 and 16, it will sadly not take much to recreate a sense of crisis across Europe and let's be very clear, a real crisis in terms of reception capacity in Greece, already struggling to manage current arrivals. So there's the question, has the European Union managed to learn lessons over the last 20 years, or have we drifted apart? And where might the dynamics of the next years take us? Two decades ago, it was easy in Tampere to be ambitious. Well, not that easy, but it was possible to be ambitious. We had a blank page upon which we could set our goals without having to address the realities of realizing them or dive into the details. Every decade has its own tone and topic of conversation with respect to migration. In the aftermath of the Balkan conflict, 
there was a strong recognition that some form of common approach will be needed for the European Union to respond effectively to humanitarian crises in its neighborhood. This was cut through by concerns that so-called asylum shopping was taking place. In the last years of the 20th century, few countries had established the comprehensive immigration systems that exist today. Germany, now a leader in this regard, had not yet convened the Independent Commission on Immigration. And the European Union was a smaller collective of states, awaiting the accession in 2004 and 2006 of a dozen new members. Our understanding of what it means to build systems that can respond to changing needs, shocks, and competing interests was far less sophisticated than it is today. But many of the conversations were eerily similar to those we have today, as the minister has pointed out. As the background papers for this conference highlight, and the temporary program attests, the importance of strong partnership with third countries, the value of creating a robust space for education of asylum claims, and the need for consistent legal means of migration are there in front of us. In this respect, little is changing concerning the chapters of migration and asylum policy we discuss as they were framed by the temporary milestones. The changes are instead about the means through which these policies are achieved 20 years ago. Justice and Home Affairs was an island more than an area. Using legislation, above all, to expand the incoming common space. Today, Justice and Home Affairs is part of a broader network of actors working on migration through not always in agreement, let's, let's say, but through legislation, while that is still critical, but legislation is just one tool in the toolbox. Policymakers have learned that law, in the absence of adequate resources or operational capacity, is rendered meaningless to those it is intended to serve and protect. And effective responses to migration challenges and opportunities require the all of government. Ministries need to work together within countries, as well as across them. The European Union has also been on a sharp learning curve with respect to diplomacy, understanding that migration is an integral part of foreign policy is still a work in progress, but it is an essential conclusion. Tempere was therefore a statement of recognition that no state can manage migration without international cooperation. At the end of 2018, the world, including many states within the European Union, made a similar state of recognition through the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, as well as through the Global Compact on Refugees. The Global Compact on Migration is different in that it is entirely state-led and non-binding. But many of the principles and ideals exposed in Tampere can also be found in the Global Compact. As usual, the devil is in the detail. Many of the Tampere phrases that have now become apocryphal were used then with little explicit interrogation. What does solidarity mean in practice today? How does Dublin link to Schengen? And how far is the fate of Schengen depending on finding a fair, balanced solution for Dublin? No, I'm not talking about Brexit. Many of these concepts and interlinkages were discussed in Tempere on the basis of a strong yet implicit common understanding between states. Today, we have to recognize that the ideas in Tempere mean different things to different member states. And uh, this is also due to the very real experience that we have had at the external borders of Europe. Migration and asylum dynamics today are quite different from those in 1999. And so are the concerns that Tempere holds, as well as it does, 
its principles, its values, its goals, its priorities. It's quite talkative about the universality and the continued relevance of Tampere. And I, here I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister Pavel Liponen. Only his coolness and the very famous Finnish pragmatism allowed the European Council to succeed 20 years ago, and I think that we all Europeans are in debt to you, Pavel. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the last five years have been a particular challenge for the European institutions. Rather than building, many officials have been engaged in a battle to prevent backsliding. But in doing so, have also created new tools and opportunities, not least the very important renewed mandate of agencies such as EASO and Frontex. Sorry, I am from the old guard. I still call it Frontex. There is the belief among some in Brussels and the capitals that with some breathing space, there is an opportunity to regroup, to rebuild trust that has been lost between member states. And that is the key issue. Rebuild trust among member states, but also, don't forget, rebuild trust among EU institutions and, most important, rebuild trust of the public opinion on the management of the migration and asylum systems. I'm very hopeful of the presentation of the new pact on asylum and migration that has been put forward by uh, the new president of the, the incoming president of uh, the European uh, Commission. Now I stop here speaking as an European. I cannot forget that I'm hearing the capacity of Director General of IOM, which is not an European institution. It's an international organization, a related agency to the UN system. And therefore I will conclude with five remarks on a different capacity. I would like to suggest to the European leadership that uh, you should not wait for breathing space. There will never be a perfect moment to undertake the work of assessing the challenges, but uh, we need efforts to build stronger common standards and protections that require forward momentum. Volatility will be definitely the rule of the game. We need to start preparing for the next crisis because there will be a next crisis. And the worst thing we could do was running behind the next crisis, because that would undermine the public opinion trust on the capacity of the authorities to manage the challenges of migration and asylum. Yes, of course, budget is important. And money is relevant to achieve the targets. Gaps in funding will leave some mobile populations vulnerable across the world, and we should not be driven solely by proximity of these movements to Europe. But money alone does not solve problems. There is a need to constantly link money with results and monitor and evaluate the impacts of our joint endeavors. Please do not assume the status quo today will be the status quo of tomorrow. And you need to be forward-looking in designing the policies. The drivers affecting mobility are constantly evolving. Policies will need to be flexible enough to adapt or they will break. And this requires constant evaluation, monitoring and review. And employment and lack of jobs and jobs opportunity in countries of origin is still and will remain a key driving factor. But insecurity, lack of the rule of law, threats to peace, the proliferation of terrorist groups will be equally relevant to anticipate where the next crisis is going to happen. As well as climate change and environmental degradation will be each time more and more driving factors, push factors for mobility. Do not assume, please, that public sentiment is motivated by flows and legal status alone. We need to be serious in taking into consideration 
the anxieties, the doubts, the fears that some sectors of the public opinion express in relation to migration. But at the same time, we cannot let down being clear and adamant in underlying the positive impacts of migration and making clear that a core part of the European identity and values is the recognition that member states are sovereign to control their borders, to define their own migration policies, but the treatment of people should always respect fundamental rights irrespective of their legal status. My organization is an organization that has grown over the past two decades with the expansion of the justice and home affairs space. And we have worked in close partnership with the European Union and its member states. In doing so, IOM has been a key actor in the realization of many of the temporary objectives alongside with UNHCR. And I'm very happy that both the High Commissioner Grandi and myself are here today in front of you to recognize not only the joint collaboration that we have, but also the strong support of the European Union. We look forward to contributing to the next two decades of Tampere 2.0 and reaffirm our commitment to transparent, workable policy that can serve the needs of migrants and all European populations. And bearing in mind the forecast of life expectancy, I hope to be invited for the 40th anniversary of Tampere. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Minister, fellow keynote speakers, Mr. Liponen, ladies and gentlemen, happy United Nations Day. And uh, thanks also from me to the Finnish Presidency, to the European Migration Network, the European Policy Center and the Odysseus Network for convening this very important conference. The response to movements of refugees and migrants continues to generate very divisive political debates, both in Europe and elsewhere. It continues, in particular, to test European common values, of which so much is said, in a manner that certainly was not imagined. I wasn't there, but was not imagined when the Tampere conclusions were adopted 20 years ago. And yet much of the vision that shaped their call for a common asylum and migration policy remains valid today. A comprehensive approach addressing political, human rights and development issues in countries of origin and transit, working in partnership with those countries. A common European asylum system founded on the recognition that protecting those fleeing war and persecution relies on regional and international cooperation. Fair treatment of third country nationals that favors integration and respect for rights and responds to racism and xenophobia and effective management of migration flows that prevents exposure to trafficking and exploitation and weakening of asylum systems. In pursuing this vision over the last 20 years, the European Union has provided a global example showing how a regional approach to refugee protection can be made to work upholding and building on international standards. The right to asylum was embedded in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The common European asylum system became a reality, painstakingly constructed through a framework of European law. A groundbreaking subsidiary protection regime was developed along with innovative shared data system for identifying and documenting asylum seekers. The Tampere conclusions and the work that followed helped inform and shape 
as uh, Antonio Vitorino just said, the two global compacts affirmed by the General Assembly last year, one on refugees and one on safe, regular, and orderly migration. These were developed in tandem, albeit through different processes and with different aims, reflecting the importance of working on migration and asylum together, especially in the context of mixed population flaws. This approach is reflected indeed in the strong partnership between UNHCR and IOM. And I thank Antonio Vitorino for being very loyal and supportive of this cooperation. However, certain core aspects of the Tampere vision, as was already mentioned, were not realized. And this became evident, once again, in 2015, in the inadequate response to the surge of arrivals through the Eastern Mediterranean. Elements that had been envisioned but not implemented, for example, a temporary protection regime supported by a financial reserve for situations of mass influx, could have strengthened the response. Instead, the failure of European solidarity at that point, despite strong and principled leadership within the EU and by some member states, and the, sub and the consequent failure to mount an effective shared response, shook public confidence and allowed for the emergence of very damaging narratives. These continue to challenge the Tampere vision today as some of those who aspire to political leadership cynically exploit legitimate anxieties, as Antonio said, around jobs, security, and identity. People who are themselves excluded from the benefits of globalizations that are pitted against refugees and migrants. Pitting exclusion against exclusion is not only cynical, and immoral, it does not offer practical solutions to either. It erodes refugee protection and fails to address the root causes of mixed population flows or the challenges of integration. The consequences, lives lost at sea as search and rescue operations are abandoned, a transactional approach to refugees as commodities to be traded between states, policies of deterrence that deflect responsibility beyond Europe's borders. All these run counter to the Tampere vision. Fortunately, there is also a countervailing trend one reflected in the examples of solidarity with refugees that have emerged across many parts of, Europe's, of European society over the last few years, and which found expression at the highest political level in the Global Compact on Refugees. This provides a powerful set of tools to address refugee flows, based on the principle of shared responsibility. They, uh, they uh, resonate with the ambition reflected 20 years ago in the Tampere conclusions and can help shape the Tampere 2.0 agenda that we're here to discuss today. With that in mind, and uh, not to be less uh, clear than the Director General of IOM, I also wish to propose five key directions. <laughs> First, we need to a truly global approach that addresses the root causes of refugee flows. Refugees are displaced by conflict, violence, and persecution. They do not leave their countries out of choice. This calls for concerted action to prevent violent conflict from emerging and to identify and accelerate solutions. Sometimes the root causes of conflict, inequality, exclusion, poor governance, climate change can also drive irregular migration flows. I urge the EU to continue to work to pursue a comprehensive approach to encompass the internal and external aspects of asylum and migration, as foreseen in the joint Valletta Action Plan, with special attention to Africa. 
Second, arrangements for burden and responsibility sharing with the countries and communities hosting large refugee populations and with, some tra and with transit countries must be deepened. 85% of the refugees are hosted in poorer regions and middle income countries. We know that consultations will start soon on a new pact on migration and asylum. Solidarity with refugee hosting countries, including through increased humanitarian and more strategic development support, should be key elements. Resettlement must also be stepped up because it saves lives and offers stability to refugees and it sends a powerful message of shared responsibility. We appreciate efforts underway to admit 50,000 refugees in Europe by the end of the year and look forward to the implementation of the 30,000 places pledge for 2020. Third, solidarity within Europe must be enhanced to preserve rescue at sea and ensure access to asylum. And I welcome the efforts by several member states with the support of the Finnish presidency to expand the current ad hoc disembarkation arrangements into a more reliable mechanism. Fourth, asylum systems and integration both need resourcing. The current arrangements for substantial portions of the asylum migration and integration fund to be set aside for asylum-related activities is a good model. We particularly encourage investments in partnerships with civil society actors, refugee and migrant-led organizations, and local and regional authorities. And fifth, the Tampere 2.0 vision should include, let's not forget, a concerted effort to eradicate statelessness, a key element of my organization's mandate. The first ever Global Refugee Forum, and I conclude, will be convened in, in Geneva in December. It will be an important moment in which we chart a path forward for the implementation of the Global Compact on Refugees through concrete pledges. In striving to implement the Tampere vision, the EU and its member states will undoubtedly continue to be important partners in this global effort. This will send an important message to refugee hosting countries and refugees themselves around the world, showing that beyond the damaging unilateral approaches that sometimes capture the headlines, a commitment to addressing refugee flows through international solidarity and through principled and pragmatic approaches still prevails in Europe today. Because if this is not true, there is no doubt that we will be, collectively and individually, a little less European. Thank you. Madam Minister, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. I think uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to share with you some ideas. Of course, anniversary is always something to look back and to learn the lessons and to look at the achievements. But I think it's also a wonderful moment to look forward what we have to do and what is what we have on the agenda. And I think there is a lot about this. I'm very grateful to the Finnish presidency to organize an event like that because I think it's a crucial moment we are living in. It's a crucial moment because whenever a new commission is starting, this is the moment where you can get movement. And everybody is expecting that. And it's the only moment that uh, really something can happen, something fundamental. And I think this is needed at this moment because uh, what we can see as a European migration organization, that is that we are in a gridlock. Gridlock, that is something where you have so different positions that nobody can move forward. And everything is stocking at the moment. So I think uh, this is the moment, and this is my experience also as a foreign minister of Austria for a long time, that we have to 
take this moment to come along with some measures just to break the grid look and to move forward. And this is also the title that we have been choosing as ICMPD for this year. We have been sitting together with our 17 member states all over Europe, not all in the European Union. And uh, we have been sitting with our advisory board, with experts, with the academics, to bring together different measures that we are proposing for this great moment. And this was uh, an exercise that brought up 70 different measures. Don't worry, I will not go through it with you. It will not be the time for that, but I would like to pick up some of these issues because I think it's uh, a good input for this discussion we have today in Helsinki. So what we are proposing is, first of all, we have, uh, I think, a lack of a common view and we have no common vision. If you are looking uh, to 27 member states of European Union, hopefully maybe also Great Britain, let's have a look what is happening within the next weeks. Then there is a big lack of these common goals. What do we have in common? And I think there is a lot we have in common, but we, we don't look at this. We are always talking about details where we can't find a compromise. And if you have no chance to find a compromise in the detail, you have to look what is your common wish. And for that, I think the first exercise should be to look what do we have in common? What is our vision for the next five years? What would we like to achieve within these five years? And I think there is a lot that uh, could be done if you do this exercise with the heads of states and governments in European Union. And then if you have this common vision, I think you feel uh, much easier to find something where you really find a compromise in the detail, but not the way around. The second point is one of the crucial issues, return. If you have a look to the numbers, we have a lot of uh, return documents every year from European Union states. And if you have a look to the numbers of effective return, there's a big gap. So I think it is necessary to concentrate on a solid return management cooperation system uh, within the European Union for the future, because this is an issue of a rules-based approach to migration management. And of course, you have uh, also to look what are the benefits for the countries that have uh, to receive uh, their people back and what could be done for reintegration. So a huge program is needed. The third one is uh, about labor migration. We all know that we have in different countries of European Union a lack of skilled workers. But of course not everybody would like to accept somebody to come. So how to come forward in that? What we are proposing is that we should start with some pilot projects with those countries who would like to see skilled workers in their countries. And we have to involve also the private sector because uh, it's their needs that we have to recognize just to find these solutions uh, really successful. So I think uh, what we need is some, to find some programs, some pilot projects with all the countries that are willing to accept uh, workers from different countries. And we should also use the opportunity to take a form of a specific EU program for young African entrepreneurs. I think what they need is some experience. And we could organize such a program based on the Erasmus Plus program and uh, to look forward how we can motivate them to learn in Europe and then to go back and to bring up their own enterprise. The fourth point is about the Western Balkans. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know there is a big challenge that uh, with all the refugees coming to Europe, first of all, on the, Western, on the Balkan routes, they will start in different countries there. 
And if you have a look to the developments, we all have to notice it's not enough that has been done. So we have to help them. We have to integrate them in the European migration system. We have uh, to help them and to support them to find also the ways to negotiate with the countries of origin. If you have a look how many embassies does Albania have in the African continent, you will not find a lot of them. So this is needed, of course, to help them to find the right negotiations, the right ways how we can start to have a real good system in place in the Western Balkan countries so that they also can proceed with all the asylum procedures and to find their solutions. And the fifth and last point I would like to raise with you is involving the private sector in general. I think it's so needed to give them security issues, to invest in the countries of origin. If we would like to change situation on the ground in the countries of origin of refugees, you have to involve the private sector with investment, with uh, trainings for people and to look forward how economy can be established in a sustainable way in these countries. So, uh, concluding with that, because I've got the sign, uh, one minute is left, I would like uh, to thank very much Presidency of Finland. I think uh, the concept you have been sharing with European countries, a whole of migra migratory route approach, is the right one. I think this is totally uh, to the point what is needed in Europe. And uh, we would like, of course, to continue to support you. I think uh, it is really something that we have to create for the future, a system of cooperation, of innovative cooperation with the countries of origin along the migratory routes and to come forward uh, with a good discussion starting for this moment a new commission comes in place. We would like to invite you also to come to Vienna, 21st and 22nd of November. We are organizing a Vienna migration conference where we can deepen our discussions and where we would like to see you. Thank you very much for your attention.